Are you in my seat? Yeah? She's going to do the Q&A instead of you. Okay. <laughs> She's Here falling asleep though, so... Here you go. You sleepy girl. You gotta wake up, Kiki. Hey, I'm Mark, and this homestead here is where I'm lucky enough to call home. I live here with my partner Alice and two dogs, Gigi and Kaya. We came to Portugal in 2021 to find a homestead, pursuing a dream of ours of becoming more self-sufficient and connecting us back with nature. In February 2022, we found our perfect property in the beautiful Sal Mamad Natural Park in Alentejo. After one year in a homestead experiencing one of the hottest summers and wettest winters on record, we've learned a hell of a lot, but we're learning more every day. Follow us as we navigate life on our Quinta, doing many of these things for the very first time and acquiring a bunch of new skills along the way. Hi everyone and welcome back to our channel or welcome to our channel if you're new here. So as we hit 5,000 subscribers, which I still find is crazy, we thought we'd do a Q&A. Uh, we do get plenty of questions in the comments and everything, so it'll be good to answer those questions a little bit more uh, fully and also give you a bit more of an insight into us and our life here. Firstly, thanks for all the support. Like, to get to 5,000 subscribers is crazy, like I didn't think anyone would even watch, so um, to, to, to have 5,000 people that uh, subscribe along is, is crazy, but thank you so much. The first question is, what is your point of view regarding the language barrier in Portugal? Is it doable or is it more of a constant frustration? And are you guys learning Portuguese in the meanwhile? So it's definitely a hard language to learn, uh, especially when it comes to pronunciation, especially for us, <laughs> uh, the verbs, etc. We use an app uh, at the moment called Practice Portuguese and we try and do that every day. And it's definitely been the best uh, app we've used so far. We also go out for a coffee in our local village every day. So it's a good way for us to kind of mingle with the locals and try and listen to how they kind of say things and pick up things and also practice or put into practice what we're learning. So the language barrier is quite difficult, uh, particularly here in rural Portugal, where a lot of people don't speak English at all. <laughs> so we um, are having to, to learn more and apparently living in such a rural place means there's quite a strong accent. Even for people that speak Portuguese it can be quite difficult here. But yeah we're trying to learn more and more and as Alice said uh, learn from the locals, uh, try and have conversations with them and understand their way of saying things. So in places like Lisbon, Porto and the Algarve you can definitely get away with speaking English and not having to learn it. However in rural places it's definitely really important. So we're glad we're learning Portuguese and trying to overcome that language barrier. And it's also something that we really want to do. It's important for us that we do live here and we want to be able to speak the language. We've decided that, you know, we would like to go for uh, citizenship further down the line. So as part of that, you do need a, uh, a, a language test. So we want to be fluent um, or as fluent as possible way before that. So we're well... <laughs> Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might be an ambitious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we want to be able to pass the language language barrier <laughs> and least. be and be able to have a conversation with yeah. the people around us. Yeah. So the next question is: Did the swells work? Do you already see improvements in the soil? So yeah, the swales did work. I mean, the flooding and the heavy rains that we had uh, in the winter were, were was a, uh, the biggest test we could have asked for. Um, obviously the only ones we had at that point were swells that we actually dug by hand. See the sheep running across the land. <laughs> yeah, the, the swells we had then were only the ones that dug by hand. So whilst they weren't massive, they still served a very important purpose. And that was to uh, retain uh, water and stop it from running down our very sloped land too quickly. We've planted loads of trees in the berms and they're already doing so well so yeah I'm really pleased that we did that and we're going to continue to introduce more and more swells on our land to be able to improve the soil quality even more over time. Do you have friends in the vicinity? Are they Portuguese or expats? If expats from where do you entertain or visit friends? So yes we do have friends in the vicinity uh, it actually took us a little while to, to, to make friends purely because, as we've said a lot, a lot of times, we do work and obviously we have a lot of stuff to do around the land as well. We have friends from 
all over really. Um, we re more recently, we've been meeting some more people which are locals. Our other friends are uh, Dutch, Lithuanian, English. Um, so yeah, like a, a mixture really. There are way more expats here than we, than we initially thought, being it is so rural, but um, yeah, we feel it's important to have a uh, mixture of uh, friends from different backgrounds. Uh, and more recently, I've actually been playing football with the local, the local lads. So it's been nice to kind of integrate more into the community in that respect. So we've actually met people in the most random of places. For example, uh, we met some people in the vets. Um, we also met some people in local shops. So we just bumped into people and got to know them. The YouTube channels also help too because uh, we've had uh, people message us on there. So one of the concerns we had about um, moving somewhere more rural is that we wouldn't meet many people or uh, make many friends. But it's definitely not worked out that way at all. As Mark said in the beginning, we were kind of tied up with a lot of things and it can be quite overwhelming when you move on to your land and you have a lot to do. Um, now we have a bit of a better balance of kind of social life and, and working as well. So um, that's definitely made things uh, a lot better and meant that we've met more people and that we spend time with more people too. We do entertain people here, especially now we have our new seating area and we have plans to create a bigger entertaining space in the future. And then we also meet people for lunch or go around their houses and farms too. Yeah, so our initial concern about not meeting people has actually gone completely the opposite way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> met loads of people. Yeah. <laughs> good. Are you getting more dogs? <laughs> I don't think it's in our plans anytime soon. I mean, having dogs is a big responsibility, as you all know, and luckily our dogs are quite small, so we still can take them away. So you, if you follow us on our Instagram, you'll see that we do do some city breaks and we always take the dogs. So two is kind of, I would say, the maximum. Anything yeah. more than that, it starts getting difficult if you're trying to rent Airbnbs or just trying to be out in general. It can be a bit tough in busy places. We would really love to like rehome a dog, but I think when you've already got existing dogs and you know you never know kind of their temperaments really, so it can be a bit tricky. But never say never. We love we love dogs and all animals really. So who knows? Yeah, yeah. We actually <laughs> used to volunteer at the local dogs home where we lived in the UK. So yeah, we are dog lovers, but I think uh, uh, two is is kind of enough for us at the moment. Yeah, we need to be realistic at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Are those electric shears okay or just Gen Z stuff? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm flattered that you think we're Gen Zs because we're a bit older than that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I couldn't do without them. I think that they're one of the best purchases mm. we've had. Like 100%. just just pruning the fruit trees, it just it goes it goes through the branches like butter, and it also helps with our sort of smaller. Um, kindling we use for firewood as well it's really easy to cut up mm -hmm. if you've ever used manual shears for a time then you'll know that your hands like completely ache after we actually introduced the electric shears to our friends and they're like sort of blown away by it so <laughs> i highly it's not just gen z stuff um whatever that really means uh, but yeah i highly recommend stuff like that because it means you can get through more stuff without the the kind of manual fatigue anything to make your life easier on the farm and I we've said since we bought those shares that they are probably up there with the best purchase we've ever yeah, made for definitely. the farm definitely <laughs> definitely are you planning to have animals if so what are your plans before we moved to Portugal we kind of were, were like we're gonna have chickens we're gonna have sheep we're gonna have goats we were yeah I thought we were gonna have like a we're gonna farm. have them all <laughs> yeah we were gonna have a zoo from day one um uh, yeah we quickly came back down to earth <laughs> when we when we moved i mean um mark's mentioned on previous videos we kind of were looking after the previous owner's chickens for a little while when we first moved in and that was a good kind of introduction into animals other yeah. than dogs because we had never had i guess anything other than dogs in the past and we really enjoyed it we really loved having them around when they did go we were we were actually quite sad weren't we yeah we have uh, we got a bit attached to them actually yeah <laughs> and obviously having eggs every day was uh, was was lovely we definitely want to have animals and we have discussed it a lot but again like we kind of don't want to put too much pressure on ourselves straight away we've got a lot to be getting on with uh, around the farm and our jobs 
and we still want to live at the end of the day like we're in Portugal there's so many beautiful places to see we haven't really seen any of it a fraction of it yet so yeah. we want to explore and kind of live life a bit so it's definitely on the agenda but I think we've both agreed that maybe not quite yet a lot of our friends as well kind of got animals very quickly when they moved in to their farms and they've kind of all said like don't rush into it because it is a huge responsibility it's a huge amount of work it adds a lot onto your kind of daily to-do list and I mean our yeah. to-do list is daily is pretty pretty manic as it is so yeah it's good to kind of learn from other people and kind of what they've done and and you know don't kind of make the same mistakes if you like yeah exactly so I think like the long and short of it is we're, we're going to get animals just just not yet <laughs> What is the weirdest insect you, you've you encountered on the farm or in the house? And are there any dangerous bugs? So I'm not sure if there's any that are dangerous to us particularly, but there are ones that are dangerous to dogs. I don't know the name of them. We're going to have to find that and maybe put it in this video. But um, there, there's, there's these uh, black bugs, which are maybe the size of your little finger and they have uh, orange stripes. Apparently they can be quite poisonous to dog. I checked online after and it's called the red striped oil beetle, which basically when it's threatened, it expels a reddish toxic liquid, which is a uh, cantharidin that can cause like burns and irritation to human skin, but it can be very poisonous for dogs if they ingest it. So best to try and keep the dogs away from them. And also the, um, the black and orange centipedes, we've come across a few of those and they are absolutely massive. Apparently their venom can kill dogs. Uh, again, like it could affect humans if you have allergic reaction, but I, I don't think it, it, they're necessarily deadly. And also you do get scorpions and stuff here as well. But um, yeah, I, I guess insects that are dangerous to us, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't I really mean, think so. Not that we know of anyway. I mean, a lot of our friends are always sending us photos of like some mad insects that I've never even seen before. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't really get... Loads, like we do get like kind of what you would expect, like Mark said, obviously the processionary caterpillars, like I never really knew of oh, them yeah. before. They're obviously very common. You even get them in the UK, but yeah, it was never really made aware to us before until we moved here. And obviously there, they can be quite bad for humans as well. So they're not really the mm. nicest of things. So at this like time of the year, we're always very cautious. But yeah, I guess living in the countryside, you're always going to get things like snakes and spiders and things like that and bugs. Yeah. Um, so Nothing that we know of is deadly though, so... You know. Yeah, and I wouldn't say anything super weird. I mean, some things felt weird, first of all, when we first moved because we weren't kind of used to it. Coming from city life, you're not really used to seeing like all Loads these of different, insects. Yeah. <laughs> different things. So I think you quickly get kind of used to it. But yeah, not anything super weird. No. The next question is, what's your background? Not really sure exactly kind of what you mean by what's your background, but um, yeah, we'll try and answer it. Uh, so the you could say our background is not farming. Um, <laughs> Far our, from it. <laughs> our, our garden was uh, very, very small in Wales. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. Uh, couldn't we couldn't even we, grow grass in there. No, no. And, and <laughs> DIY, you know, we, we actually oh. had a new build. So um, yeah, like I guess uh, putting a picture on some mirrors on the wall was probably the furthest we went. So mm. almost everything we do here is, is completely new to us. Um, you know, like... It can be quite overwhelming, but I think you just get on with it. I guess like our background in terms of anything that we're doing now is is kind of non-existent. So hopefully that answers your question. In terms of kind of like careers, we've both um, kind of come from like office jobs, if you like. So that kind of ties in with what Mark just said around not being very hands-on in terms of like DIY, uh, you know, outdoorsy kind of stuff. We've always been kind of behind the computer um, and doing things there. So yeah, this is very different to kind of our backgrounds in terms of career. Yeah, not related at all. <laughs> so the next question is, what do we both do for work or employment wise? So this is the one of the questions we, we get a lot. Uh, and um, uh, we, we do like to keep our, our lives like pretty kind of separate. So obviously we have our YouTube and farm life and then we have our actual career and stuff. I guess you could say we provide uh, HR and people services for technology companies. Uh, it's actually 
uh, a company we set up together. I left a, a corporate job uh, to do this. Uh, no, no investment, no funding. So we've we've gone from kind of not being able to pay our bills to to kind of being able to move out here. So, how many hours per week do you work on your remote jobs? It kind of varies. I mean, I think it's been quite hard to get a balance <laughs> in terms of like our work work and then land work. So we don't have a specific kind of amount of hours. It kind of varies as well, depending on how much work we have in both areas. And then we work around that. And also the weather kind of plays a factor. So when it's like super, super hot in the summer and, you know, you can't really go outside and do manual work, we tend to focus a bit more on our day jobs, if you like. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't really have a specific amount of hours. We just try and work it as best as we can. We're quite lucky in the sense that we have our own business, so that brings flexibility to us. We can decide what hours we work, which makes life a lot easier. Yeah, because it's our own business, you know, we can we can really dictate like when we work and how we work. Obviously that that also means we can kind of work with demand. Mm. So Alice, as Alice said, like if we've got more stuff on the farm to do, we'll we'll prioritize more farm work. You know, it, it, for example, in January our, our actual uh, day jobs were quite quiet, so we decided to, you know, not really do much work and focus on stuff on the farm. We got mm. loads done. So, yeah, I guess having our own company just give, brings that flexibility where, you know, sometimes we'll work 50 hours a week on, on our jobs. Other times we'll, we'll, we'll work half of that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we just kind of adapt. How do you find the balance between the day job and the kinta? Yeah, so this is a, a good question and it's something that I've actually struggled with quite a lot since moving here. Um, it wasn't actually something I envisaged that I would struggle with. But I think because they're two very different things, moving here is a very slow paced way of life. Uh, it's very relaxed, very peaceful. And then kind of the day job is very hectic, very much the opposite. So trying to get a good balance between the two has been something that's personally for me has been quite hard. I think basically we're we're struggling to get to to still find that balance. Like some sometimes we we do it really well. Mm. We'll be like, okay, well we need to get uh, X Y Z done with our day jobs, and then we need to get um, A B C done with all of the stuff around the land. So we'll, we'll set time aside. Mm -hmm. It's sort of times where we are sort of in and out of both jobs, so we find it a little bit difficult. And because they're so polar opposites, you know, like our, our day job is taking on it's literally draining our mental energy. Uh, and obviously doing stuff around the land is the physical energy. It's it's very, you know, you've got to be careful with it. I mean, recently I got super burnt out from, you know, getting up early in the morning, doing stuff around the farm. Uh, then then I uh, do my day job for a little bit. Then I do more stuff around the farm and then I'd be editing YouTube videos at about 10 o'clock at night. So like, I guess we need to um, sort of understand that, uh, you know, sometimes you can get burnt out, burnt out mentally and physically and you know you, you you have to find a balance between the other where you're not kind of burning both candles at both ends if that makes sense yeah so we're still working on it for sure and like mark said sometimes it's easier sometimes it's a bit harder depending on how things are especially when things unexpected happen so with the flooding and then you know we had all the aftermath of um trying to sort things out after that that wasn't in our plans <laughs> because no one uh, saw that kind of come in so sometimes things come in unexpectedly and then you have to you know adapt quite quickly and change your plans and that can be your kind of day job too or uh you know farm life so yeah it can be hard with unexpected things coming in too yeah that never ending to-do list just always gets added to yeah. <laughs> always growing <laughs> What tractor do you have? So yeah, I realised I haven't really uh, explained uh, much about the tractor. I mean, I um, don't really know loads about tractors either, <laughs> but it's a Kubota B2350, 25 horsepower, 2008, so it is used. A few people have asked for some advice around buying tractors here. Uh, there's uh, a lot of old imported ones, like 30 to 40 years, years old, uh, which you can pick up for relatively cheap. However, because they are imports and they don't make those models anymore, it's very, very difficult to get parts. So 
I always say it's worth kind of spending a little bit more on a tractor to get stuff that you can actually fix. Otherwise you could just be replacing those uh, imported tractors further down the line. If you had 5K to spend on your first day in Portugal for essentials for the house and the land, what would you get? So should, should we assume you already have stuff like a bed and things like that? <laughs> what sort of stuff has made it easier for us around the land? So I'd say the electric shears, Oh, is a what yeah. is one <laughs> definitely up there um i guess it depends on your goals and yeah. things like that i mean if you've got sort of a few hectares like us you need stuff to manage the land a chainsaw a strimmer yeah. do you want to grow food you know you're going to need some sort of growing setup um, it's handy to have a greenhouse so you can extend your growing season do i think that mm -hmm. that's essential probably not yeah it's hard to say because everyone's kind of uh, what people come here for and what they're planning to do is quite different because we do have a lot of land and a lot to manage. Tools for the land uh, are quite important. And yeah, like Mark said, kind of solar, but you could get a generator maybe to keep to kind of get you started. Yeah. Um, as a bit of a backup, maybe like if you've got a well and you want to kind of use that water, maybe a water pump. Yeah. I think this it's a really good question, but quite hard because it, you need you almost need like a context like a scenario like yeah. we have you know like a ruin with nothing in it you know then we would probably would uh, you yeah. know it would be different yeah. a different answer to we have a house that we can move in below to land which has not been managed for a number of years but yeah i think that at the end of the day anything that's going to make your life easier mm. is, is sensible you know i tools and stuff to manage the land are, are essentials that that's pretty you know the first week we went out and bought a strimmer a chainsaw yeah. and a few other things um to be able to manage our, our, our land um because you know some of the stuff needed cutting down straight away and obviously the other land that we bought the two hectares that's been abandoned for for years so we needed to try and uh, get some stuff to to um manage that a bit better mm. and i mean after you like add up all the tools and stuff it doesn't really 5k doesn't go super far does it no in the grand scheme of things when no. you are buying tools like they are quite expensive especially if you want to get like a a good a good make that you know you're not going to be replacing you know every few months or every year so you kind of want to invest a little bit extra in the beginning to make sure that you know what you're getting is going to last you so yeah i don't think 5k really goes too far in the grand scheme of things when you're buying tools and stuff but yeah yeah if you can bring stuff like from another house you, you lived in or if you're moving from abroad you know like just bring helps. bring everything you can yeah what's been your biggest mistake since moving I think not learning enough the language uh, quickly enough, to be honest with you. Mm. It, I mean, it's quite overwhelming moving to another country anyway and like buying a lot of land and completely changing our lifestyle, still having to work. Like there were kind of things that we really are prioritizing now, like learning the language, which we feel we probably should have prioritized a little bit more to begin with. Mm. And also like making making more of an effort with with like with the locals. Like I don't know whether we were like scared of like not fitting in or not being accepted and stuff like that. But I think that that mistake of not trying and not going out was was probably one of our, our, our biggest and, and now we're kind of trying to make up for it. And at the end of the day, like people do accept you if you make an effort, if you just kind of not bother then you know you're never going to be accepted in, into the community so for me i think that was probably the biggest mistake yeah i would agree i think especially kind of not uh putting ourselves out there sooner um you know there's it's not to say that it's like it's too it's not too late to do it now like it's definitely not we we're um you know we are being accepted into the community and with the locals and it means a lot to us and we do wish and we always say like we should have done this sooner but you kind of have to go with what feels right at the time and you know we were we realize now how overwhelmed we were in the beginning and it is very daunting and you know especially when you don't speak a language like being in a place where you can't communicate with people it is really it is really tough but people are super friendly and um you know we just putting ourselves out there in kind of awkward situations has made life so much easier because now we don't have that kind of 
anxious, or that kind of anxiety of just going out and or like walking into a cafe and, you know, people do stare at you because they know that you're new and, you know, you're not from around here. But kind of getting past that point of being where it doesn't bother you so much and just going for it, I think, is changed things completely for us. So I wish yeah. we would have done that sooner. But, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason and, you know, it kind of maybe we needed to wait until now when we felt a bit more comfortable. But yeah. yeah. If you're if you're feeling the same as, as we did and you've recently moved to Portugal, like just make an effort because the Portuguese people are so welcoming. Mm. Um, they appreciate people coming here. They're very friendly and they're also very patient. Uh, you know, it's it's just little things. So, yeah, if, if, if we could have done our Portugal journey again, I think that we would have um, kind of tried to integrate ourselves more earlier on. Yeah, for sure. So the next question is, how did we find our land? So we found our land online. The house itself was actually advertised uh, through uh, Remax, but we spotted it on Facebook. Um, I think you spotted it actually, didn't you? The other land that we bought with this one, we actually found how oh, that was for sale from the people who owned this house before us. I actually came across this list, the listing for this house on Facebook. The owners had kind of uh, published it themselves. So I didn't actually see it on the Remax website. And I mean, we were trying to keep as up to date as possible with yeah. things, weren't we? So it was quite lucky um, when we saw it and yeah, we messaged them straight away and kind of got a view in pretty pretty quick. Well, I think you um, messaged them like a few hours after it got posted. So I think that we were the first view in as yeah, well. Yeah, which was lucky because they did have a lot of interest as well. I think the viewings got booked up really quickly. So luckily we were in there kind of first. <laughs> yeah. So the next question is, did you become Portuguese residents with the purchase of your land? Okay, so uh, we did go like dived in headfirst with the um, residency. So we sold everything in the UK, came over on a holiday visa whilst our sort of residency was going through. So when we bought the house, we already had our stage one of the D7 visa. As part of the stage two, you need to obviously continue to prove that you have somewhere to live here. So. Uh, with our house, we were able to, to to use that as part of the D7 visa to to show that we had a uh, a long term residence. Who is your favourite knife sharpener? Yeah, so uh, thanks uh, to our friend Barry for that question. Uh, it's obviously him. So our friend has a knife sharpening business here in Alentejo. He goes to a lot of the uh, markets around the Port Alegre district. So. Uh, we'll put in his uh, details in this video if you want to contact him and our local and you need anything sharpened from knives to axes and machetes. We feel it's important to try and use local businesses and services where possible. So we always recommend to people to try and use those local services where you can. What are some of the hard truths of moving to Portugal and living this way? So I think to begin with, um, it's quite it can be quite lonely, uh, especially moving to quite a rural place and coming from a city where it's very busy. It's amazing to be living this life, but it does take a bit of adjustment. Even though quiet country life can seem like you're living the dream from str straight away, you do take a lot of adjusting, especially when you're going from polar opposites, like living in a city, noise everywhere, people around you, just being able to pop to your friends and your family's house, like coming here, it, it, it's it's a real kind of it can be a real struggle to get used to obviously once you do make that transition like the benefits are just amazing like it's just feel so positive and thankful to be here but to begin with it felt like a little bit mm. odd like overwhelming like the it could be something as simple as there's like we live in the middle of the countryside there's no light light pollution at all so everything is literally pitch black which is actually beautiful but yeah. like you're just not used to it like your body sort of takes some time to adjust so that is one of those things like don't expect it to be like an easy transition because it's not but you once you get through that it's uh, uh, just amazing you also have the convenience of having access to things so easy. Uh, like, for example, in the UK, you can kind of 
get what you want when you want. Like here it's very slow paced. So that was quite hard for us to begin with. Yeah. Like things move so slowly and uh, it can be very frustrating. But over time you um, kind of learn to love it because it's, it's actually quite nice. Um, but when you're used to just having everything like there straight away, it can be super hard just being in a different place in general it is it is hard you know like we've kind of answered this in some of the other questions like it's hard not speaking the native language um it's it's hard not having those little interactions with people that you're used to. but th that's a, another reason why we want to really learn this language because we want to be able to kind of have those interactions and th the language not to be a barrier but it can be be quite hard i mean there's there's been a few situations where I've had to speak to people who don't speak any English and I didn't speak any Portuguese. Like for example, when I was trying to sort my license out to be able to go back to the UK, I was ringing the IMT lines and no one would speak to me in, in, um, in English. And obviously because it was quite a, a, a difficult situation to explain, you know, I mean, I think like six people put the phone down on me, which was a little bit challenging, but again, like it's all of these things that are hard truths, but kind of, spur you on to do better and to learn and to to improve your your way of thinking yeah and i think like all the challenges we face since living here it hasn't put us off it has made no. us fall in love with the place more and like these kind of challenges and awkward situations you kind of have to go through uh, make you learn make you grow we don't have any regrets about our journey or moving here in general like if anything yeah we're, we're more happy than we ha ever have been but yeah. you know having such a drastic change in your life of course are gonna bring like awkward times and uh and difficult things that you have to face but i guess it's all part of kind of learning and growing um growing through it as well so yeah yeah wouldn't change any of it and like the the just just the learning of everything like i said you know like we've this is kind of complete contrast to how we were living before so yeah. just learning things like what seeds germinate at what times like when to plant yeah. stuff out when to when to cut stuff when to prune trees so even, even like you know like we've never had a septic tank before so like understanding how the septic tank works how we need to manage it how we need to keep it um like running like running normally it's just all of these things like yeah. they are they if you let it it can really overwhelm you but um you know that that's at the same time you know like that's the only way you can grow and learn mm. so thank you so much for all of your questions we really enjoyed reading them and answering them for you and hopefully you've got to know us a bit better yeah, so thanks so much for watching and thanks to everyone for supporting the channel. We really, really appreciate it. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more context into our lives and stuff. Always happy to answer more questions in the future, but hope that covers it all for now. Thanks, thanks for, for watching, watching and, and we'll, we'll catch you in the, the next, next video. video. The language back. <coughs> Spit out. <laughs> How, where, just everywhere. No, that sounds stupid, just everywhere. So, how, how... <laughs> Now. You can just read it. The viewing's got a uh... <laughs> is obviously <laughs> it is oh I don't know what I'm saying. I can't think anymore. Can not seem again, like so I was like going like this. we say thanks for watching i'll catch you in the next video at the same time what are we saying thanks for watching and we'll catch you in the next video okay. thanks for... we'll do a countdown okay three two one thanks, thanks for, for watching, watching and, and we'll catch you in the <laughs> we should be in sync thanks Thank... see it's not in sync okay. three two one <laughs> it's like we're in a job interview <laughs> <coughs> I don't know what to say now. <laughs> okay. Ready, steady, go. Um, as... I need to stop saying them. Um, <laughs>